Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here in the John Hope Franklin Center at Duke University, and we are joined today by Professor Alicia Lola Jones, who is Assistant Professor of Ethnomusicology at Indiana University, Bloomington. She is also an ordained third generation Pentecostal Word of Faith preacher. How are you doing, I'm Dr. Doing well. Jones? It's so great to be here. So let's start with the fact that you're here as part of an, an interesting and innovative conference around black creativity, yes. black dance, um, and black theology. Um, yes. So talk a little bit about the conference, if you may. Yeah, so I'm here as a part of the African American Theology and the Arts Symposium that is being convened at Duke Divinity School by Ebony Marshall Terman, and it's a great collection of scholars across disciplines who are thinking about how uh, African American approaches to religiosity are uh, multi-dimensional, um, encompassing music and dance and the preached word and that they are not uh, extricable from each other, that um, you can't have the preached word without a sung piece, you can't have the dancing without uh, the spoken word, it all is in conversation. Um, and we are just enjoying the synergy, uh, being able to translate, <laughs> you know, our disciplines to one another. We have homileticians or preachers. We have liturgists, people mm -hmm. who think about the structure of the worship. But then also we have practitioners who are uh, demonstrating that worship can be um, at the dance bar in a ballet <laughs> class. Uh, so we have some Ailey dancers here, and we're talking about public theology with folks mm -hmm. who never sat in a classroom to study it formally, but we're having some deep exchanges and conversations. It's been rich. So, so one of the fundamental tensions, anxieties, if you will, around the black church is what to do with the body. Right. <laughs> Right. In the black church. I mean, we could say that's a, a fundamental anxiety in black studies writ large, but, mm -hmm. but definitely in the context of the black church. And so one of your most well-known pieces, <laughs> Pole Dancing for Jesus. Yes, yes. Talk a little bit about what you're trying to get at and thinking about what we might, you know, most folks would think about as very different images. Right, <laughs> That right. we rarely would be, think about as being in the same space. Right, right. So. First, I would like to say that when I think about African American worship as an ethnomusicologist, and I um, uh, recall my interactions with men as an ethnomusicologist of men's studies of African American worship, um, one of the things that I've found when people talk about African American worship is this, uh, this extra musical component of how we think about the ways that men lead us in worship. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is in addition to their vocal ability or their instrumental ability, um, there is this aspect of how they present themselves. People may characterize it as flamboyant or effeminate or mm -hmm. um, I use the term feminine masculine. Mm -hmm. um, but these aspects of how they use their gesture, they may say it's soft. They may say it's um, like a woman. Um, it's gracious is a term that I've, mm. I've heard. Um, all of these are, f are coded as female sorts of characteristics, but somehow they become problematic when men um, use, it, right? yeah. And so I wanted to think of a provocative uh, way of getting at gesture and movement and how that matters for gospel mm -hmm. enthusiasts, gospel performers. and. And the early stages of my uh, research, when I was trying to decide whether or not I really wanted to do this masculinities thing and what do I have to say about it as a woman, um, someone uh, dropped this performance, this, this uh, viral performance into my inbox and said, what do you think about this? And it is uh, a performance by uh, my conversation partner and good friend now, Tavon Hargett, mm -hmm. who is referred to as uh, uh, Jungle Cat, that is his mm -hmm. stage name. And he was doing a performance in his home to I Need You to Survive by <laughs> Bishop Hezekiah Walker. <laughs> and when I saw the title of it, I just knew, oh God, this is gonna be some sort of you know, jab at the church and perhaps you know, these stereotypes of the flamboyant yeah. choir yeah. director yeah or the latent homoerotic aspects mm -hmm. of, of, of Christian worship. Um, but when I clicked it, when I actually got brave enough to click the video and look at it, 
What I saw was a, a young man um, in his home, dimly lit in fatigues and Timberlands and uh, T-shirt locks, um, approaching the pole and, and doing really fundamental um, amateurish sort of gestures. He would describe it as such. Yeah. And what I learned through interviewing him was that he had taught himself pole fitness. And he wanted to find a way to worship God on Easter Sunday. And what came to mind was that he wanted to, to place before God this new skill that he learned, uh, which is pole fitness. Now, when I tell people the entire story, they don't always believe it, and that's fine. But my job as an ethnomusicologist <laughs> is to convey the story. And he tells me that he was from North Carolina, you know, in a, from a rural setting, had never, um, had never witnessed a strip club, didn't know the, the uh, blatant erotic connotations of it. And it wasn't until he posted it online and had that globalized conversation like. <laughs> right and it was picked up by Washington Post HuffPo um, and Alicia Jones <laughs> and so I've written about it and what I found why this matters for my research is that I found there are meanings and uh, metaphors that are gendered um, and that uh, uh, evoke this sort of anxiety um, and we we understand the meanings, but we have not been able to articulate it, such as a man worshiping on a pole to a god that is conventionally constructed as male. And, and it's interesting when you mentioned that particular dynamic, right, that he chose that this is the way I'm going to express my love for Jesus right. on the pole. And, and I think about E. Patrick Johnson's mm -hmm, work, mm -hmm. you know, Spirit in the Dark, right? Yes. How the club becomes a space of worship, right, right, and, mm -hmm. and community for folks who are not feeling that community when they're in an That's actual a church. Piece, yeah. <laughs> yeah, using Shirley Caesar's Hold My Mule. Hold My Mule, yeah. <laughs> which, I mean, there's so much to be said about that particular mm -hmm. piece and, and what, what that means in terms of, you know, self-discipline, but then also abandon. Um, but, you know, electronic musics, um, house music would be in under that um, mm. umbrella. Chicago house, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Provide a space, an alternative space where folks can explore not only affect, which I have um, a colleague, uh, uh, Luis Manuel Garcia, who, mm -hmm. who studies affect and EDM, but it's also a place to uh, explore sensuality, um, the closeness, um, acoustics, because of the reverberation of the music as you are, um, as you spend time in that space, and then also spirituality, um, especially in black um, settings uh, for electronic dance music, whether it's Chicago house um, or if it's um, Baltimore house music. Yeah, so people are broadening how they express their spirituality. And it's been really fascinating um, once I get men to talk about their, yeah, yeah. their personal practice and yeah. how they are stylizing it. Um, it's been really fascinating to see that they are willing to talk about it. Um, they're just waiting for folks to ask. Um, and I, I view my research as um, being a, a tool and a resource for churches, synagogues, um, uh, uh, faith communities that are experiencing a decline in worship because men aren't seeing a model of masculinity with which they can identify. That's a great point. You're watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here in the John Hope Franklin Center. We're joined by Dr. Alicia Lola Jones who is an assistant professor of ethnomusicology at Indiana University. Let's talk a little bit about your training, right? So, so you have a bachelor's degree, Oberlin, from the conservatory. Yes. You have a master's of divinity. Yes. From Yale. Yes. And then, of course, the PhD in ethnomusicology, you know, from the University of Chicago. Yes. Um, how does all of that training impact how you see Right. You know, and hear the world, right? right? Particularly around, you know, the black gospel tradition and particularly around this idea of where masculinity is within this tradition now. Right. Well, you know, um, I, I initially when I started at Oberlin, um, I, I went there after attending Duke Ellington School for the Arts. I need a shout out, Duke Ellington. Um, I, my, my goal was I wanted to be a good music minister. You mm -hmm. know, I wanted to serve the church. Um, but I didn't see models of ministry with which I could identify. So I didn't know what that would look like upon completion. Well, real talk for a moment? Yeah. I ain't seen many ministers that, that, <laughs> that, that look for, like yeah. you. Right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, but now there are more yeah. and more. And it's, it's a pleasure of mine to, 
to speak to women in ministry and men in ministry who are trying to um, maintain um, integrity, um, mm -hmm. think about character, but also innovation. Yeah. And yeah. I got tired um, throughout my journey, I got tired of characterizations of people who are charismatic Christian or who are from Word of Faith or Pentecostal um, settings as being uh, um, ignorant or lacking uh, substance. Yeah, lacking substance. Right. Um, I really wanted to challenge those notions and push back. You know, um, be uh, reflexive, but then also to to share the resources that I've encountered. So, at any rate, you know, my journey um, seems peculiar. It seems mm -hmm. unique to channel one of the concepts that I like to play with peculiarity. But a lot of the ministers that I have admired over the years in D.C. have had some sort of uh, formal uh, music education, theological education, and perhaps not a degree in ethnomusicology, but they have mm. uh, had deep interest. So people like uh, Reverend Nolan Williams, who's an Oberlin alum, uh, Reverend Richard Smallwood, mm -hmm. Um, and then folks who tangentially complement my interests, which would be um, the great Evelyn Simpson Currington, uh, uh, Mrs. Garrett of Eastern High School, who has cultivated so many musicians out of Eastern High School in Southeast mm -hmm. DC, and the various musicians who have worked with the um, Washington Performing Arts Society and who have mentored, uh, I think, an awesome uh, cadre of musicians like myself who really want to preserve and then add their own voices to uh, music, uh, especially in gospel music. In, in your forthcoming manuscript, you know, you're working through ideas of, of black masculinity right, in, right. in the black church. Um, there have been a lot of suspicions and speculations about queer black male bodies in the church, right. whether, whether we're talking about uh, someone like Reverend James Cleveland. Right. Um, Donnie McClurkin, of course, is an interesting mm -hmm, figure in there, mm -hmm. but, but the figure that we know that, that kind of comes out is Tone, yes. right? And you think about the shift from Tone and, and then this new characterization of himself as a B. Slade. Mm -hmm. um, how do you read Tone slash B. Slade, you know, both in the context of the performance of gender within the black church, but also what he's doing musically? Because right. what I find particularly fascinating about B. Slade is that the music is extraordinary. Right. Right. But it, it, you're not going to hear it on the radio, right? right? You know, R&B doesn't quite know what to do mm -hmm. with it. Gospel obviously is like, you know, right. Right. that needs to be way over there. Yeah. So, so what are you reading in a, in a figure like uh, Tone slash B. Slade? Yeah, so Tone, uh, who was born Anthony Clark mm -hmm. Williams, um, he was the first uh, major gospel producer to come out as unapologetically gay. Mm -hmm. He was not the first to disclose uh, that he had uh, passed as a same gender loving like, man. Like Donnie McClurkin. Di like Donnie yeah. McClurkin and even Daryl Coley, both of mm -hmm. whom would identify themselves as or at some point have um, identified themselves as delivered from homosexuality mm -hmm. or ex-gay. Um, so Tone, uh, the artist formerly known as Tone, Brian Slade, and by the way, he has several stage names. I could imagine. Yeah, <laughs> like at least nine that we know of um, because he's a multi-instrumentalist and he right. associates a stage name with each instrument. Wow. Um, he is extraordinary to me, um, viewing him in worship services. He can go through the band and just uh, mm -hmm. shed with each mm -hmm. uh, musician on not just a proficient level, uh, not just a competent level, mm -hmm. but a virtuosic level. Um, musically, uh, as a vocalist, um, his attention to dynamics and color is, is I, I get excited as a vocalist hearing him um, saying he was the first interview, uh, he was the first subject that I interviewed um, that uh, actually inspired me to move on. I had just finished um, entering, um, interviewing uh, Jungle Cat. Okay. And uh, I had on a whim decided to follow up with Tone because it was on the heels of his disclosure of right. being right. openly gay. And he replied immediately back and said, let's talk. And 
And uh, that conversation was so humbling because I had done a lot of work researching the sorts of questions people were asking him mm -hmm. that were moral, theological. Right, right. Um, does he believe that he is, you know, out of the will of God? There's a great television interview, like, when did you decide this right. lifestyle? Right, and he's right. like, what do you... Right, with Lexi. Lexi <laughs> right. would be one. Yeah, so I, I knew where the pressure points uh, yeah. were. Um, and I wanted to know. I wanted to know about him as a musician. Mm -hmm. And I also, perhaps, and this this is me as a caregiver. I wanted to know uh, what his community was like. You know, who could he go to? Who was reaching out to him? And he was so uh, personable, very witty. Yeah. Um, conceptually, he's quite intentional about the meanings yeah, that he desires yeah. to generate, even with the, the idea of B. Slade, which is uh, short for Brian Slade, a right. character in the film, the 1990s film, uh, Velvet Goldmine, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is a representation, many believe, derived from David Bowie of a, of a bisexual glam rock right. artist. That's who he's channeling. Right. And so definitely he's targeting a broader audience, audience yeah. with the meanings that he's generating from his uh, stage name. Coincidentally, um, within the last two years, which falls in line with the timeline that he told me during that interview I just mentioned, he said in two years he'll return back. And in two years, which would have been 2014 from that interview, he, I uh, saw him uh, return to stage as a gospel artist using his government name, mm -hmm. um, Anthony Williams, at the Howard Theater. It was uh, protested online previous, uh, prior to that particular performance, but when I got there, there were no protesters. But a lot of musicians who perhaps would not openly disclose that they were uh, Tone fans. Right. And he did music from his uh, Tone catalog, not his B. Slade catalog, uh, but the, the level of musicianship was still there. He does appearances at Stellar Award pre-shows, which is a gospel music mm -hmm. industry award mm -hmm. show. Um, and he, he's, he's been paying a lot of tributes to gospel greats like LaShawn Pace Rhodes. Um, and collaborating with people who might be unlikely conversation partners like Ty Tribbett performing yeah. uh, live with him. Ty, you know, yeah. famously right. Right. spoke against right. homosexuality. So, so much I can say about it. You know, it, it's interesting because there's a way in which, you know, B. Slade is Frank Ocean before right. Frank Ocean, right? right? And, and, and so much more of it. I mean, there's volumes of work from, right. from B. Slade. Right. You know, we got one My <laughs> Frank Ocean album. Um, but also, you know, when you hear someone like an Anderson Park, okay. right? You know, okay. you can hear, you mm -hmm. know, where a B. Slade fits into right. that kind of right. mix. Do you think the fact that he's not more well known hmm has to do with the early choice to choose gospel as a lane, right? Even before him working through the sexuality piece, but choosing to be a brilliant instrumentalist in gospel. Do, do you think that's a choice that inherently limits what his audience could have been? So this is a conversation uh, that I find myself in all the time in terms of what it means uh, career-wise, creatively, um, uh, even in terms of a person's longevity uh, to choose the path of gospel music, it is admirable, obviously. I think you know it is admirable to choose it, but it also means there's a ceiling in terms of mm. how one may grow creatively, mm. um, the sorts of musical conversation partners that people can have. Now, many would, um, sus many would anticipate that his choice to come out would shut down his productivity. And he did have to, and, that, and that's part of why he changed his name. Right, the re he had to recalibrate. Yeah. Right, he right. had to detach himself from a tone of uh, gospel affiliated um, expectation right. and following. And actually in doing so, he has broadened his clientele and yeah. his collaborators. Makes from sense. Sheila E. to Shanice to, <laughs> I mean, several R&B artists working with uh, people like the Jackson family, folks with whom he may not have worked if he stayed within uh, that niche. Now, that also could be attributed to the coverage that he has received in The New Yorker right. and various documentaries that have put his story out there and have um, really uh, portrayed the sort of sacrifice that he made in doing as he says and as many others say, uh, stand in his truth. Uh, I think that what he has come up with in terms of 
basically like four uh, albums a year now. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, the productivity it's, is, is pretty amazing. It's huge. <laughs> but he does that so that as a producer, people can hear his versatility and have right. a sample of it. Right. So he does a combination of the sort of free mixtape style and then stuff for purchase. And get little Prince references. Right. And said, yeah. Right. And, you know, he is unapologetic about his ability to pay homage to a Prince and to a Michael Jackson. Yeah. He wants to not only at least um, the impression that I got in terms of how he evokes mm -hmm. uh, their musical style. He wants to not only associate with them and to honor, but to also demonstrate his competence and mm -hmm. how he can mm -hmm. take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. He, you know, he and his his uh, his followers um, are referred to as vocal ninjas. And I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, he can vocally and instrumentally do a lot of amazing things. You're watching Left to Back, Black, and we are joined here today by Dr. Alicia Lola Jones, Assistant Professor of Ethnomusicology, Indiana University. Uh, you know, the old heads will say uh, that the music is really bad these days. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and, and at some point you realize it's because they only listen to the radio, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. They're only listening right. to Tom Joyner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there is a wealth of music that's out there right. today um, mm -hmm. and some amazing stuff. What are you listening to? What These am days. I listening to? I'm listening to Adele. Mm -hmm. I am listening to a lot of world music. Mm -hmm. I, um, I am delving into Bollywood. <laughs> I like Bollywood. Bollywood is great. I'm also listening to Leontine Price. Talk about that. Leontine Price is like a, a, a name that we don't talk about enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, she was born Mary Violet Leontine Price, and I would think that uh, many African-American <laughs> vocalists herald her as one of the godmothers. Right, right. Um, if you Google uh, her, you may find her as the American right. singer. Before Jesse Norman, listen, before Kathleen Battle. Listen, right. um, and she would be a contemporary of another great Grace Bumbry, who's mm -hmm. an awesome diva. Mm -hmm. I would probably place her on my list as well. Um, the, their command of language and presentation comportment is just amazing, amazing. And um, what they signified in terms of an international regal presence for mm. black women mm. um, still inspires me uh, to, to hear what she has to say about personhood and representation. Uh, and then even the more perhaps mundane but really vocalist sort of uh, things that she would say in terms of I wake up every morning and put on my pearls and toast my voice, you know, those sorts of things just are nice comedy for me. Um, let's see, who else am I listening to? I'm listening to um, Naomi Solomon, my cousin, who's a singer-songwriter. She just released her album. Guitars. Guitar. Nice. She plays a guitar, um, acoustic guitar. Um, and the lyrics are just really quality. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. Um, not that repetitive music isn't important, but I, I like the detail that she's she's attended to. So, you know, one of the things we've been doing this year with Left of Black is that we've been uh, creating small little playlist hmm. for folks, you know, asking folks to put together on the spot okay. a little five song playlist. Okay. So you in the club. <laughs> Um, and if you were to curate a five song playlist for folks up in the club okay. on a Saturday night okay. that will get them to church to church on Sunday morning. Interesting. <laughs> what are you introducing in the club on a Sunday night to get folks to church on a, on a Sunday, Sunday morning? That's on a Saturday night to get folks into church on a Sunday morning. Okay. I got it. <laughs> Let's start with, well, I'm from D.C., so I would probably say some gospel go-go. Okay. Gospel, well, go-go is a percussive funk right. music, you know. Um, so give me some names of, of folks who do gospel go go. Well, um, let's see. Critical, uh, critical cr CRB. We mm -hmm. call we we refer to them by acronyms. Mm -hmm. um, that would be a band. I like Peculiar People. They're on a hiatus. I'm trying to get them to come back. <laughs> but their song "Dance in the Rain" is okay. one of my favorites. Um, let's see. I, I would probably do some throwback Tone. Okay. Uh, Tone song Blend. I okay. like Blend by Tone. Really great. Uh, let's see. Hmm. In the club. I got to think of five songs. I like... 
like old school gospel though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We could do we could do Shirley Caesar's Hold My Hold Mule. My Mule. We could do that. Let me think about that. Hold yeah. on. That that threw me for a loop. Yeah. Hmm. Any Chicago House? Chicago House. Um uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. The woman. Thank you, Father. Who uh, was Alicia Myers. Yes, but yes. I want to thank you. I want to thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Father, for yeah. shining your light As soon as you drop that, me. as soon as you drop that, people go and, and work it out. If we're going to talk about Chicago, <laughs> how, how am I going to pay my bills? Yes, you could throw a house beat under that and everybody will go in. Yes. Okay. I think that's fine. <laughs> yes, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I got to think about that. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty good. You've been watching Left to Black. We're joined today by Dr. Alicia Lola Jones, who is Assistant Professor of Ethnomusicology at mm -hmm. Indiana University. She was trained at the University of Chicago in Ethnomusicology. She is also an ordained third generation Pentecostal Word of Faith preacher. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you Left for having Black. me. I appreciate it. This is You're great. Welcome. This is good work. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Black lights and boots burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything